From 1979 until 2003, Saddam Hussein ruled as president and undisputed dictator of Iraq. His reign was noted for a number of wars, his oppressive security apparatus, and his personal involvement in the cruel treatment of his people. In today's video, we will cover Saddam's rise to power from a low-level assassin to the head of the country, and to his eventual downfall. Saddam Hussein's story is one of brutality, war, and suffering for so many. Saddam Hussein was born on the 28th of April 1937 in a small village near the town of Tikrit. Accounts vary as to the fate of his father, who either died of cancer or left his family months before Saddam's birth. In addition, Saddam's brother died of cancer aged only 12 years old, again before Saddam had even been born. The result was that Saddam was seen by his mother as cursed and as somehow responsible. In her grief and depression, she was unable to look after the young Saddam. He was instead sent to live with his uncle, Karela Talfa. Talfa's political beliefs would shape Saddam's own. He fought against British rule, was an Arab nationalist, and had a hatred of Jews and Persians. It was through Talfa's influence that Saddam would join the Ba'ath Party, and at age 20, he would take part in an assassination attempt of Iraq's autocrat, Abd al-Karim Qasim. In an ambush against Qasim's car, it was reported that Saddam started firing prematurely. During the attack, Saddam was shot, likely in the crossfire by one of his fellow assassins. Qasim would survive the attack, with Saddam heading to Syria and then Egypt in exile. In July of 1968, the Ba'ath Party launched a coup to finally seize complete control of Iraq. During the 1960s and early 1970s, Saddam developed his position in the new government. He acquired the position of Vice Chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council, effectively second in command. One of the key roles he obtained was the head of security, responsible for preventing any counter-revolution against the new regime. As part of building up his power, Saddam recruited heavily from his own tribe, with Tikritis taking positions within the security apparatus loyal to their benefactor. One of Saddam's key aims was to modernize Iraq's economy, using the country's vast wealth held in oil. In June of 1972, Saddam nationalized the country's oil and was able to massively benefit from the subsequent 1973 energy crisis and the explosion in the price of oil. Saddam used some of the funds to start the National Campaign for the Eradication of Illiteracy and the Campaign for Free Compulsory Education in Iraq leading to access to education for hundreds of thousands. All the while, Saddam was positioning himself to take over control and assume the presidency. By 1979, Saddam was in a position to remove the elderly president, Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr. What followed is perhaps one of the more infamous actions Saddam undertook. Shortly after seizing control, Saddam convened an assembly of the Ba'ath's party leadership. The event was to be videotaped. Saddam sat on stage smoking a cigar, whilst Mohi Abdel Hussein, a leading member of the party and secretary to the previous president, was forced to declare himself as a traitor. He then proceeded to read out a confession and gave the names of 68 others part of the conspiracy. The 68 men were then dragged away. Those left in the audience had no idea whether they would be called up next. Some started to shout, long live Saddam, protesting their loyalty in vain hopes of survival. Of the 68 men who were taken away, 22 were executed that very same day. The remaining 48 were made to be firing squads and carried out the execution of their fellow traitors. In the days that followed, hundreds of more party members met the same fate. In a disturbing display of power and ruthlessness, Saddam cemented his position as the undisputed leader of Iraq. Such brutality would become commonplace during Saddam's rule. Televised public executions were part of daily life, including some that involved the condemned executed with dynamite. All manner of tortures were employed, including hangings, electrocution, and the burning of cigarettes into people's eyes. Saddam was known to personally take part in the torture of his victims, a trait he would pass on to his sons, Kusai and Uday. In a now infamous prison, as many as 50,000 people were held as political prisoners. Mass executions of prisoners were organized with as many as 2,000 killed in a day on the orders of Kusai. Perhaps one of the bloodiest actions undertaken by Saddam was the Iran-Iraq War. The conflict started in September of 1980. 
not too long after the Iranian Islamic Revolution. Despite initial claims of peace between Iran and Iraq, Saddam was eager to avoid Ayatollah Khomeini's influence reaching the majority Shia population of Iraq. The war would be a way for Saddam to not only deal a blow to the appeal of Khomeini's rhetoric, but also improve Iraq's borders. Saddam hoped to prove to the rest of the Arab world that he was the man that the rest of the Middle East could fall in behind. Saddam would strike against Iran during the fallout from the revolution, where much of the Iranian military was being purged and at a time where it was weakened. Iraq launched attacks to destroy Iranian air bases whilst it sent in its armoured divisions. Many hopes for a quick victory were dashed when Iran launched their own airstrikes against Iraq and managed to stall the Iraqi advance, with Iran's air force unscathed. Iran deployed the besiege, which included children as young as 12 to the elderly as old as 80. In tactics that would become synonymous with the war, the besiege would be used in human waves, sometimes to clear minefields, or with squads of men and boys given a particular objective that they would achieve at any cost. During Operation Ramadan, a series of Iranian offences launched against the entrenched Iraqi forces. Thousands of poorly trained and equipped besiege charged the Iraqi emplacements, in the face of huge losses. Such actions framed Saddam as a moderate force when compared to Iran. During the war, both the Soviet Union and the United States saw Iraq as the perfect check to revolutionary Iran. Whilst the Soviet Union and Iraq had an existing alliance, the United States sought to build one. American support to Iraq was given in the form of technological aid, intelligence, and the sale of dual-use chemicals and biological warfare-related technology, which had previously been restricted. In the end, Iraq and Iran fought to a stalemate, with a conflict that was typified by entrenched warfare and the occasional use of chemical weapons by Iraq. In all, it is thought that some 50,000 casualties of the war were caused by the use of chemical weapons which had only escalated as the conflict wore on. In the end, a ceasefire was agreed after the deaths of some one million people, with little in the way of the objectives achieved. Iran agreed to the ceasefire because it was largely pushed to do so by its war-weary population. Whilst in essence a draw, Saddam framed the end of the war as a victory. The famous crossed swords of the Victory Arch were built to commemorate the defeat of Iran and was decorated with the helmets of fallen Iranian soldiers. One notable consequence of the war was that following the use of the deadly chemical weapons against Iranian forces, there was little action taken by the international community. Whilst the acts were condemned, there was no action taken save for minor condemnation. Seemingly getting away with using chemical weapons against Iranians, Saddam would turn to such devastating weapons against his own people. During the Iran-Iraq war, Kurds in northern Iraq were targeted by Saddam, with chemical weapons employed against civilians and fighters alike. Kurds are a distinct ethnic group that have long been marginalised and victimised in many countries, and to this day do not have the benefit of their own state. During the Iran-Iraq war with Iranian backing, a significant Kurdish uprising was launched against Saddam's regime. One of the worst actions carried out against the Kurds was the Halabja chemical attack. The city had not long been occupied by Iranian forces when it was subjected to both conventional mustard gas and sarin bombardment. The man who gave the order was Ali Hassan al-Majid, who would go on to be known as Chemical Ali. At least 5,000 civilians are known to have been killed from the attack, with another 10,000 injured. This was but one attack against the Kurds that formed part of the Anfal campaign. This campaign has been classified as a genocide against the Kurdish people. Anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 people are thought to have been killed. But in 1990, Saddam gambled and lost in his invasion of Kuwait. Motivations for the invasion can largely be grouped into three key reasons. Not long after the failure of the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam was indebted to Kuwait, who requested payment. Kuwait was part of the OPEC oil cartel, but had sometimes exceeded the quota set, much to the annoyance of the other members as prices dropped with the influx of Kuwaiti oil. And finally, Saddam viewed Kuwait as Iraqi territory and sought to rebuild a greater Iraq with expanded borders, gaining access to the Kuwaiti oil fields. 
Throughout 1990, tensions escalated to the point where Iraqi troops were on the border and Kuwait was accused of stealing Iraqi oil. In August of 1990, Iraqi forces entered Kuwait and easily conquered the country. Led by the USA, the United Nations condemned the invasion, started a trade embargo, and set about building a coalition to beat back the Iraqi army if need be. Saudi Arabia acted as a staging ground for 37 countries to build up a joint armed response. When the deadline for withdrawal was ignored, the United States-led coalition initiated a round-the-clock bombing campaign against Saddam's forces. Ground forces, largely made up of US and UK troops, pushed the Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Around 175,000 Iraqi troops were captured, as many as 50,000 were killed and another 75,000 wounded. As the Iraqi army retreated, they initiated a scorched earth policy, setting ablaze 700 Kuwaiti oil wells. Following the conflict, Iraq's infrastructure was heavily damaged, access to its chemical weapons was demanded, and economic sanctions kept on the country. Kurds were protected by no-fly zones, whilst weapon inspectors saw the destruction of Saddam's biological and chemical weapons stores and factories. In 1995, the now infamous Oil for Food program was launched by the United Nations. It was intended to keep sanctions on Iraq, thereby diminishing Saddam's military might, whilst providing relief to the Iraqi civilians languishing under the economic sanctions. During its implementation, around 60% of Iraq's population were dependent on the UN rations from the program, but the program was exploited by many, including Saddam. A 2007 report by the United Nations noted that some 2,000 of the participating companies paid kickbacks and levied illegal surcharges to gain access to the oil. Saddam is thought to have embezzled around 1.8 billion at the expense of Iraqis and to the benefit of those gaining access to cheap oil. In December of 1998, Saddam refused access to certain sites to UN weapon inspectors. Following this, the UK and US launched Operation Desert Fox. From the 16th until the 19th of December, a number of Iraqi sites were subjected to missile attacks, with the goal of reducing Iraqi's apparent chemical and biological weapon capability. Around 100 sites were targeted, including 11 weapons production or storage facilities. But the end of Saddam Hussein's rule was brought about by the full-scale invasion of Iraq in March of 2003. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. It was just over 90 minutes beyond President Bush's deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq that U.S. warships and planes, there were F-117 stealth bombers involved, launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The attack came in waves, cruise missiles, followed by the F-117 stealth bombers with so-called bunker-busting bombs. Their target, a bunker believed to be sheltering what are called top leaders of the Iraqi regime. Now, this is what it looked and sounded like in Baghdad. It was this short, and this is what happened. US President George W. Bush, whose father led the world's response during the Gulf War, insisted that Saddam still continue to store and produce weapons of mass destruction, and that when combined with his support for terrorist groups, this proved a dangerous combination. The US was still reeling from 9-11, and it was alleged that Al-Qaeda was supported by the Saddam regime. The push to war was very much led by the United States and the United Kingdom without a large coalition of countries supporting the conflict. But the justifications for the war would soon be proven false or misleading. Some of the notable examples included in the British claim was that Saddam could launch chemical and biological weapons within 45 minutes of the order, which likely was a misleading statement based on the intelligence that it would take 45 minutes for Iraqi rocket teams to ready a launch site. Another included assertion made by Colin Powell was that Iraq had mobile chemical and biological weapon laboratories to evade weapons inspectors, though these were in fact used to create hydrogen for weather balloons. 
Despite the protests, the invasion went ahead, with the Iraqi army largely unwilling to fight. It would be the paramilitaries loyal to Saddam's regime engaging in serious fighting. By April of 2003, many of Iraq's major cities had fallen into British and American hands, with the country's leadership fleeing and entering into hiding. Saddam gave one of his last public appearances in April in a Baghdad suburb, though he could not be located when the city was taken. On the 22nd of July, Saddam's sons were located in a villa in the city of Mosul. They were killed following a firefight with American soldiers. Numerous attempts to locate Saddam failed, with dozens of his family interrogated as to find his location. It was not until December of 2003 that Saddam would be found in a small farm compound near his home of Tikrit. Saddam had hidden himself in a spider hole and was captured without putting up any resistance. In now famous footage showing Saddam's fall from power, the bearded, dishevelled man was subjected to a medical examination for the world to see. The new Iraqi government readied Saddam for trial to seek justice for his countless victims. In particular, his crimes against the Kurds in the north and the Shia in the south were highlighted as examples of his cruelty. Saddam insisted that he was still the president of Iraq and that he had been illegally deposed. He was charged with crimes against humanity, notably for the Anfal campaign against the Kurds and the massacre of Shia Muslims in two separate trials. Much of the trial was televised, akin to the many public executions carried out during his rule. Despite his shouting, his theatrical actions and attempts to dominate the courtroom, Saddam was found guilty for the murder of 148 Shiite Muslims. The trial for his role in the Anfal genocide was still underway when he was sentenced to death. The Anfal trial would continue after his death, with Chemical Ali sentenced to death for his role as well. Saddam was executed by hanging on the 30th of December 2006, with footage of his execution and corpse leaking to the world. Following Saddam's death, the occupation of Iraq and attempts at regime change were marred with sectarian violence. Estimates vary, but range from around 200,000 to 1 million Iraqis dead following the invasion of Iraq. Saddam is thought to have killed around 300,000 Iraqis during his 35-year rule. It is an understatement to say that the Iraq War is one of the more controversial conflicts and certainly deserves a video of its own. It has since been argued that Saddam kept the lid on the violence seen following the occupation of Iraq, but others point to the numerous crimes against humanity he committed and his persistent desires, however unfulfilled at times, to use chemical and biological weapons against his own people as reason enough to remove such a dictator. From the Arab Spring to the rise of the Islamic State, much has happened that would have been unimaginable during Saddam's rule.